Welcome back to DealBook, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us once again as our day rolls on with another very special speaker. Ruth Porat is with us, and we are thrilled to have her with us. Uh, she, of course, is the CFO of Alphabet. I like to call her the architect of uh, the current structure of that company, a one-time Wall Streeter uh, who joined, I should say, Morgan Stanley back in 1987, right before uh, Black Monday. Uh, she is somebody I have known since I, I think, Ruth, I've known you since I was three years old. Uh, so it's nice to see you again, though we've seen each other uh, happily many times uh, in between uh, all of that. But there's so much to talk about, about this moment that we're living in right now, about what's happening in Silicon Valley. You're overseeing all of the things that are happening during COVID. Uh, of course, there's big policy implications when it comes to competition and everything else. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about your own personal story, uh, if we could, uh, as well. So. But, but here's where I want to start, because I think everybody's, we're all COVID crazy and trying to understand how to, to manage and operate in this time. You made a decision very early on in the pandemic to go virtual, uh, really before virtually every other company in this country. And not only to go virtual, but also to go virtual for a very lengthy period of time before people were even thinking necessarily to do that. Just take us back to the beginning of this and the conversations that you were having and the decisions that you were trying to make. Well, first, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. You've come a long way since you were three. Uh, it's great to be here. So um, in terms of the decision on work from home, you know, we did move quickly to move people to home. We were moving people out in Asia in February. First office in the States was in March. We were out of uh, the US and Europe by the end of March. And there were a couple of elements of it, which really was, I was drawing upon the experiences from the 08 crisis. And um, that sort of guided the execution path and then some of the decisions. And one of the key elements is you have to have a strong governance command and control structure around crisis risk management. So you keep the team all together and moving in one direction. The other is that you're dealing with ambiguity and as facts change, you can change, but you've got to keep moving forward. The other critical element, you'll remember this from all the OA conversations, is in a crisis, you're dealing with least worst. It's a least worst choice. And for Google, that was a new muscle because Google really had had sort of the best of the best options for so much of its life. And so now we're moving into what's the least worst option and the phrase good is good enough. And a critical element of all of this to keep us all moving forward productively as well as possible in a obviously unprecedented uh, painful period was over communicate and we were going around the clock. We had our internal site go slash coronavirus with FAQs constantly up. So people felt that we were there really caring immensely for every element of, of, of Googlers. And what I'm most proud of is we had this incredible surge in online activity at this time. At one point early on in the crisis, search surge, you know, the search queries was as hot, it was four times higher than during the Super Bowl. And when you looked at what was going on with everybody moving online to be with video conference or Google Meet product, it was up 30 times and continued to grow. And we were able to support all that while in this remote um, environment. And then we made the decision to extend voluntary work from home through June 2021, because we were really looking at this sort of piecemeal approach and you can't plan your life and get sort of a cadence that works when it's just incremental. So we stepped back and said, as people are trying to figure out where do they want to be? How are they going to make this work? It looks like it could extend. We said it is. It, there's a wellness element to just extend the, the duration out and say it's voluntary work from home through that period. I'm glad we made the decision. I think it's worked really well. It's helped put a bit more structure in, into people's thinking about what this, what this journey is. Okay, so now here's the hard question then. Are you changing the June 21st, uh, June 21, 2021 date? Uh, we had Anthony Fauci, Dr. Dr. Fauci with us yesterday. We had uh, Albert Borla from Pfizer. There is a likelihood or we hope that there will be vaccines starting to be available for the mass public at scale. Call it April, call it May. You have to take a booster. So there's going to be a three or four week period after that. What do you think is realistic for people really coming back to work? So we haven't changed the June 2021 date. And as I said, it's voluntary work from home through that period of time. From all of the internal pulse surveys and other work we've done, you know, there's a range of what people are hoping for in this, this new normal. And our expectation on return to office, which is frankly substantially more complicated than moving everyone to home, 
is that we'll end up in a hybrid work environment, some in the office, some at home. I, what you know, we firmly believe, and we've said this repeatedly, we believe that innovation benefits from people coming together. It's about collaboration, it's about serendipity, and it's collaboration not just within your team, but across teams. So we do look forward to getting people back in the office. That being said, working from home is working and there's a productivity lift not needing to come into the office. And so we're gonna continue to experiment with what is that mix? What is the space internally? One thing we, uh, we assume, or let's say we, we know, is that if we're bringing people into the office because it's about collaboration, we want our space to be increasingly about these flexible collaborative spaces. We wanna retain the quirky fun feel that Google has always been known for, but we're also looking at technology. and. Our, our technology, Google Workspace, G Suite, has always been about collaborative tools, which is very much about this hybrid environment. We're continuing to look at what else we can do. And so we will experiment. Some people likely will be coming back well before that June 2021 20, date, but it's voluntary work from home through that period of time. And we have not looked to change that date. And then we will sort of grow into people right. coming back. To the office you said time. it's harder. You said it's harder to bring them back than to go work from home to begin with. Tell us about what that looks like in your mind. I mean, and Google does have a particularly unique office space structure, often very open plan. Um, what, what, what are you working on right now? Well, so if Google, if workspace has been about collaboration, serendipity, quirky, it's fun, we want to keep that. And as I said, what we're looking at is there will be places where people can go just because they need private space alone. But the most important is to rethink what's the footprint of our space so that we really enable more of this flexible collaborative workspace coming together, whether it's in groups of four or eight or 12 in a socially distanced way, as long as one needs to be doing it that way. And so it's this flexible model. We're looking at our, our floor plates with that in mind. And we're continue, we're really excited in New York. We just had a big uh, landmark day yesterday, we're continuing to build out our campus in New York, but looking at our space as this collaborative magnet. And then, as I said, we're thinking about how we layer in um, technology and tools so that you can live in this hybrid world. And a lot of it is about collaborative docs. Right. We will continue to experiment. I think it's hard to say today that we know exactly what it will be, but we're looking at a lot of different formats. Okay, as somebody who thinks about budgets a lot, because I know you think about budgets, um, how do you think about work travel budgets for Alphabet over the next two years? We had Bill Gates with us yesterday who made the prediction. He thinks that, that business travel is going to be off by 50%, potentially for a very, very long time, if not ever. So the, the work travel budget for, as part, part of the Google budget has never really been one of the biggest parts of our budget. Um, you're absolutely right. I do look at budgets a lot. But I think the more relevant thing as we're going through planning, as in prior years, is there's a lot going on in the world and we wanna make sure that we're investing aggressively where we need to, to make sure that we're continuing to um, deliver on sort of the, what's the long-term opportunity. And as I've talked about in, in the past, that requires us to be pretty clinical about what's the stack rank of what we're doing so that we can really make sure that we're focusing where we need to, prioritizing resources where we need to, and trying to self-fund as much right. as those next growth like it's possible. You mentioned productivity uh, and the idea that potentially some employees are more productive. What, uh, you have lots of, you have, you have more data than just about anybody. How, how productive do you think employees really are these days? So at Google, we've been doing a whole, whole host of things to try and understand what's going on with productivity. Um, we do a lot of what we call pulse surveys going in to try and understand what's important to Googlers. How are they self-assessing productivity? We marry that with data as well about kind of what, what's going on in coding. How are, they, how are they feeling about what's going on in coding? And what we saw in the early days of COVID is there was a bit of a productivity dip in particular at the more junior levels. And that said to us, what we really needed also to do is double down on what coaching do our senior leaders need to help their more junior people along and had a real surge in what's called G to G, Googler to Googler training about leadership. And so as we've gone through this with these pulse surveys, we think we're pretty much back to the pre-COVID levels. One of the things we're very concerned about is what are the wellness measures? If you're happier, you're more productive. So we're focused very much on that as well. What is it about the work experience we can do that helps deal with some of the stress of being in a pandemic? What do you think about the culture, the culture of, of work from home? Meaning 
Google's always had a very unique culture, very open culture, lots of debate happening uh, on your campus, uh, person to person, but also online. What has that, well, what's that looked like during this period? It's a really great question. It goes back to my first point about crisis management. And one of the most important things in crisis management is communication. So for that reason and more, we have continued to evolve. How are we checking in on employees? How are we staying connected? And so we still are doing our all company meetings. They're being done virtually, but we've you know, meaningfully supplemented with product area meetings, functional meetings. The frequency of what we're doing has really right. picked up. And so you marry that with these pulse surveys, I, th I feel that we're more closely connected now and the, the feedback is actually, feels, it feels like we've been on this long journey at Google and we're in a really good spot where Googler's, Googler sentiment is, is strong. People understand we're trying to make right. sure we're protecting health and safety as well as everything we're delivering for users. But, but what about just the, the interaction uh, on the chat forums and the like? And the reason I say you were one of the first companies that, that dealt with uh, the rise of the employee, the outspoken employee. And I know even last year, uh, you put together policies internally uh, to, try to, to, to try to tamp down, frankly, some of the political rhetoric that was going on internally. But, but how has that transformed itself during this period? Because you know, when people aren't together, you look at a lot of social media platforms today, when people either don't have that personal connection, people are willing to say things online that they may not be willing to say to each other in a in a in a person to person world. It's an interesting question. I think we started that this journey of sort of more frequent check-ins, more at the local level. We actually find that as you evolve as a company mirroring the local level with the the full company level really helps address a lot of what you're talking about and working closely with ERGs, the employee resource group so you get a, a really important pulse of what are the issues that are um, relevant for various communities. One of the things that, that I think is so important is we very much continue to believe voice of Googlers and hearing the voice of Googlers and hearing it early is going to enable us to actually take whatever action is needed. And I'm really struck by the importance of voice of employee and making sure you have tools and systems to get it. Right. Because I only believe, you know, I've talked about this in the past, if banking had had voice of employees, early on in the financial crisis, pre-financial crisis, I think that the financial crisis could have been very different. I mm -hmm. think that somebody should have spoken up about some of these over-architected trades buried in fixed income. And there were no vehicles to unleash those right. ways. So you start from that premise, which is voice of employee is important. Then what's the vehicle for getting it? And these ch touch points are sort of both, both valuable information and to your point, release valves. So as long as there's a frequency of communication, I think you stay on top of what are the issues. Right. And so we've been on a journey. Um, I think we're right. in a good spot. But one of the challenges, and this year you're seeing the, the voice of the employees across the country, and by the way, CEOs engaging in both political conversations and, and more on social topics than they ever did before. And somebody said to me that, that the, uh, the org chart has been inverted, meaning that the employees are now the bosses, uh, that, that you, you, you can get to a point where so much power has basically been given the employee. They've been empowered, and that may be a very good thing in some respects, but from the ability uh, to necessarily make certain decisions for the business, it gets more complicated. I think there's a lot in your question. I might come at it slightly differently. I, you know, I thought your piece last week about um, stakeholders was really an important one. And the question, was that just something that happened in the thinking more broadly about stakeholders? Right. Is that just something that is the last couple of years or should it endure? And at Google since inception, we've actually had a broad definition of stakeholders and that will remain unchanged. Oh, and we have, uh, when I talk about Google, Google yeah. speaks up in response. Hey, Google, stop. Love um, that. Get I love get that. A, get out. They're, they work well. I can get any question answered. So if I can't answer one of your questions, I, I will ask. Um, but the point of what I was saying is that we have a broad definition of stakeholders and always have. And it, it kind of goes to the mission or not kind of, it does go to the mission, you know, organize the world's information, make it universally accessible and useful. And so it starts with the users. I mean, there's been a joke at Google in the early days that URL stood for users first, revenue later. And so the view is 
start with the users and that becomes a magnet for talent for your employees. We have 3 million applicants every year and then we focus on community as well. That's a virtuous cycle which delivers strong financial returns. That I do not believe changes. So I think that this notion that we need to be responsive to community is very much part of what we do. And I, you know, there have been more issues in the past couple of years that we've dealt with, whether it's affordable housing or racial right. equity or climate change, that is not changing. But I wouldn't suggest that that's not something that the leadership team is looking to drive as well with input from our teams. More Did broadly. you see, by the way, this is just making me think of it now, uh, Brian Armstrong uh, is the CEO of a company called Coinbase. And he put out a memo now, probably two months ago, uh, effectively, it was an internal memo saying that he didn't want his employees to get engaged in social issues, that that was something that he thought should be to the side, that it's their own private business, but that, that the business should be the business of business. It shouldn't be these social issues. And I, what do you make of that? So I think that if you speak on every issue as a company and use the company platform to speak on every issue, it's sort of, you dilute voice and, 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 and relevance. What we're looking at is what are things that we frankly have a moral responsibility to speak up on and take action on because it's core to what we do. And so as an example, our work around climate change, given the global network of data centers, we use a lot of energy. Our view is it's as responsible citizens on this planet since inception, we need to focus on climate change. We need to speak up on it. We need to take the actions that we have taken. We've been really forward leaning, I think leading in this area. Um, and so it would be inappropriate not to. Um, there are areas like immigration, where if you look at look at our, our senior leadership team, um, the ranks of our, our team, and what's made this country great is to have extraordinary diverse talent, we should speak up on these issues. So I think that it's part of, again, what's the broad set of stakeholders that we have, right. and we do have a responsibility. Uh, as a former Wall Streeter, you might want to weigh in. Jamie Dimon was with us uh, just this morning. And he said that the only way to make the climate uh, issue stick is to have a carbon tax. He said you have to have one and you have to do it and make it cheap. You agree? I would agree, but I think it's, it's not the only thing. So at Google, we set a goal early on to become carbon neutral. And we hit that in 2007. And then we said, you know what, let's, let's match 100% of our energy consumption with renewables. We did that in 2017. So this year, we took on what we think is the most audacious goal that we've had on climate change. We said by 2030, we want 100% of our data centers and campuses to be running on renewable energy. And what that requires is that we actually catalyze development of the renewable grid. That means we, ne we never actually emit more carbon. It's like stop it before it even starts. And so for us, that we thought that was an audacious goal we wanted to set for ourselves. We also hope others will do the same. And so I think that there is, this is such a critical issue. Hank Paulson has said, not dealing with climate change, it's radical risk taking. I think he is absolutely right. I think Jamie's right. I don't think there's one solution. I think we need to look at it in every way possible. The other goal we set is that by 2030, a billion people on the planet will be able to make better decisions for themselves as a result of our products. Things like when you go book a flight, you know, what's the carbon footprint from that flight? Right. And so each company needs to come up with whatever, and working with policymakers, working with one another, what can you do to make, me, make a meaningful difference on climate change? So I agree with Jamie, but I'd like to double down and say we have to do more. Um, okay, I wanna talk a little bit about policy before we get to your story uh, and, and your personal story, because I think it's, it's a fascinating one. Um, as you know, Google is in the headlines. I should say Alphabet is in the headlines uh, because uh, the Department of Justice has brought this case against the company. I know you're limited in what you can say about the case unto itself, but I'm curious from a societal policy perspective, how you think society should think about size and scale. This is an issue that's not just in the United States, but by the way, regulators are now for the first time looking at it in China, which is fascinating in large part because tech companies in the US often used to say, we need to be, we need to have this size and scale because look at those guys over there, we're gonna have to compete with them. Well, you know, the, the heart of your question, we've, we've repeatedly underscored that we think people come to Google, come to Google search because they want to, not because they have to. And I think if you look at the history of the company, I remember I was a tech banker back in 1998 when we all started to first learn about Google. And one of the questions was, why do you need another search engine? I think it was the eighth search engine. It's like, why? 
And the reason Google rose to the position it has is because it's a better product. It was faster and more relevant searches. And we've continued to focus on the users, I've already said, to continue to innovate. So for example, on our most recent earnings call, Sundar talked about two most recent innovations um, in search, both machine learning based. One is called BERT, where it provides better context around queries in natural language. So for example, if you were to, if you were to search um, what can I, you know, can I pick up prescriptions for someone at fill in the blank, your local pharmacy? Historically, the results may have anchored on your local pharmacy. What are the hours? Where is it? Et cetera. Whereas the context is important. What you're really looking for is can you pick up prescriptions for someone else? And so machine learning is helping us deliver better, better, more relevant responses, building in context. The other one is kind of the quirky Google. Uh, one of the most popular things that we recently announced is this hum a song and Google will tell you what the song is. And so there's still the quirky and the and the, the deep science that delivers better experiences. So long way of getting to your question, but we keep innovating and investing right. in machine learning and, and solutions to create a better, okay, so better problem. Genuine question, and I, I ask this out of genuine curiosity, how hard do you think it would be today to create a search competitor with as meaningful an index as Google, what kind of capital would it require? I mean, is, is it even possible? And do you think that, that it's so hard and costs so much money, and because you, not only is the product great, you also have arrangements with other companies that, that make it the default, that companies that might think we should try this say it, it's crazy to even begin? Well, I think the fact that we're sitting here on Zoom which a couple of years ago, Zoom was not a verb. You know, like it wasn't, it, it, there were no Zoom cocktail parties. Innovation is everywhere. And you come up with a great product and you're focused on users, um, you're, you're gonna break through. And so I, I'm a firm believer that innovation, there's innovation, you see it ar around the globe um, and it is about creating a better product. And so one of the things that's exciting about actually about this move to the cloud, us and others, is that that infrastructure spend, you actually can leverage what others have done. So when you think of all the you know, early stage tech companies, they're benefiting from the CapEx that we've made over many years and others, obviously. Um, and so that backbone is, is you know, provides the ability, you need the great idea, the great engineers, but you can leverage existing infrastructure. Uh, we're gonna have Tim Sweeney on uh, in just a bit. He runs Epic uh, Games. As you know, uh, Fortnite uh, is uh, gone really to battle with Apple to some degree uh, with you as well. How do you think about marketplaces for developers and what that relationship should look like? So I think that in every area we're in, having a healthy ecosystem is an important part of the whole thing working. And we're very focused on um, what we, how we support developers, uh, whether it's through security or reach or other elements of it. So yeah, the ecosystem continues to be an important one that we respect greatly. Okay, personal story and personal question. Tell us the difference for you between working on Wall Street where you spent most of your career and working in Silicon Valley. What's, what's, what, what's the big take, biggest takeaway? Both were intellectually curious, but I think the sheer breadth of what we cover at Alphabet um, is extraordinary. And there's this mission that is truly deeply held about how can we deliver services that are better for users? What can we do to delight? What can we do to make a difference? And I feel that the um, the, the it's sort, sort of like silly putting on your brain. You're pulled in so many different directions because of the excitement about what more can be done with machine learning to make a difference in the world. On these platforms, I talked about climate change. We're looking at what can we do on our platforms that is helpful to people as they're wrestling with what can they do to make a difference. The opportunity to address issues like this is quite invigorating. So when you think of Wall Street today, today's Wall Street uh, versus, versus the Wall Street that, that, that you lived in before, do you have, do you have different views with a, with a perspective uh, about it that you didn't have, you think, at the time? You know, I became CFO at Morgan Stanley coming out of the crisis. It was 2010, so I'd been advising, as you know, the, the Fed and Treasury in the crisis. Those were 
challenging days to get Morgan Stanley back to where it had been in, in better days. And I think what James Gorman and the leadership team has done there has been extraordinary continuing to evolve the model. Um, I haven't thought much more about being back on Wall Street since then. I, I'm enjoying right. what I'm doing. What do you think about being a senior woman in, in Silicon Valley? And just, I mean, we've been talking uh, uh, about the, the, the issue of gender and gender equity for such a long time. It seems to be a never ending story. And it's a journey uh, that clearly arguably isn't going fast enough. But what do you see happening in the Valley? And how, and again, not to compare it to Wall Street, but uh, it, it, in some ways, it's a very similar story. It is a similar story, and I completely agree. It's taking far too long um, to, to make advances. Um, I think that one of the big differences from those early days when I was at Morgan Stanley, uh, which I frankly thought was the best of the best on, on uh, these issues, but um, big difference is we talk, you're, people are talking about it. There's, a, you know, there's something called allies, um, and whether it's for women or other underrepresented groups, the notion that actually it's not just the right thing to do, but you're gonna make stronger, sharper business decisions if you have diverse views. And so there's more of an embrace. And I think that having women in leadership positions or other underrepresented groups is one part of, of um, really showing people the direction, junior people, the direction of travel and what can be done. But the most important thing is then to put process and systems around it. So whether it's things like pay equity right. or what do you do on recruiting and on down the line. If you don't have policies and programs, the words are nice, but you gotta put money behind so what you're- So let me ask you though, the, the critique though is, and, and Google has been at the forefront of being transparent about these numbers, but as you look at some of the numbers, you know, I think there's frankly disappointment about how fast, to, to your point, things have moved. Do you think that, that, we're, that a sea change is upon us? Is it, what is there an expectations management issue? People talk about a pipeline, then people, you say pipeline, then people say, well, that's just an excuse. Well, what, what do you think's going on? I definitely think there's a greater level of impatience in Silicon Valley, because if you can make the kinds of transformative changes through technology that we have, why can't we do it on this issue as we, that we hold so dear to us? And I think the problem is we're dealing with a societal issue and people take time to change and that is not acceptable and that is not an excuse. So we are trying to break through it in every way we can, whether it's unconscious bias or some of these programs that I talked about, allyship, whatever it happens to be. Uh, but yes, it, right. it is a personal responsibility. It's moving too slowly. Um, we've got an, uh, a handful of people, in, more than a handful actually, a, a lot of people who have various questions and I'm just looking at a couple of good ones and I wanna bring them to you. I also wanted to do something and I was planning to do this earlier uh, because we've been running polls with this, with this group and they're fascinating. Uh, given the conversation we we're having about work from home, I wanted to ask the following and, and see how everybody responds. Uh, how important does everybody think it is uh, that knowledge workers be on site together? I think this is such a critical question right now. And I'm very curious, we'll, we'll, we'll do it almost in real time and we'll try to get the answers back. Maybe, maybe as everybody answers, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll ask a couple more questions uh, of Ruth. Ruth, uh, uh, Cahill Bird writes in, um, if you were to give a, a grade to the tech giants during this election season, uh, Alphabet, Facebook, Twitter, whatnot, um, what kind of grade do you think you'd give? And describe a bit about what Google did and, and YouTube did uh, to prepare and what you learned around this election. So, a grade. And, um, and let me let me punt on the grade for a minute. What what did we do and what did we learn? You know, I, I am proud of what we've done in this election. Um, we've hired thousands upon thousands of people who focus on content, and we supplement that with machine learning. And the the focus has been very much on um, ensuring that we're anchored in authoritative data. And, um, and, and checking authoritative data and being you know, as, as objective as possible on all elements. So I feel that the team um, has you know, been around the clock trying to ensure that we're fairly objectively applying uh, all steps needed to ensure that we're getting people objective, authoritative uh, information. And it's, you know, it's a relentless um, effort. And so, uh, you know, I feel very proud of the work that, that we've done. Um, and that needs to continue to be the, the 
you know, driving mission for all, which right. is we're not trusted in, in, you know, and if, if, if we, we don't show, share that transparency around what is the objective data, how are you anchoring it? And that's been the most important guiding principle. Um, we've got a lot of questions uh, about this DOJ case, but let me just, I'll, I'll ask the one that actually, I, I think speaks to this. What would happen to the company if it was broken up? Meaning how successful or unsuccessful do you think, to, to the, how important are these component parts? If YouTube wasn't part of the, the, the Google search index, for example, what would happen? Well, I'm going to go back to my answer before, which is we don't believe the merits of the case. Right. We're very much the view that people come to us because of the quality of the product. And this notion, what's made companies great in this country for years is focus on delivering a great service for your users. Make sure you're doing the right things. So, you know, that to us is the most important element. The other questions, therefore, don't become relevant. Well, let me ask you this, because you, you've thought a lot about value, value in the marketplace. In fact, when you first came there and, uh, and, and really reorged the company, I think some people thought it's possible that some of these units could ultimately uh, be spun off as other publicly traded companies, that that actually might be a, there might be a business case to do that. What do you think about just that prospect? Well, I think that our model has obviously evolved over the last five years, and I assume will continue to evolve because we're in a really competitive uh, world, um, you know, the, the, that step moving to create other bets as a separate entity was helpful to get greater focus on them. Bringing in external capital for Verily and Waymo, I think has been very helpful to sort of the focus and, and path for those two. The most recent thing we announced is we're breaking out cloud as a separate segment. Um, you know, we've got a multi-year journey. We're investing aggressively in that business, excited about what that can bring. So we'll continue to look at what are the best ways to ensure that we're, you know, executing right. at the pace we need to and where that, what that might mean to create value, long-term value. Okay, as you were speaking, uh, the group was uh, polling. Do you want to guess in advance? I don't know the answer. We're going to get, we're going to find out together. One to five was the question. How important do you think knowledge, for knowledge workers it is to be on site together? I'll ask you two, two ways. What, what, what do you think the, what do you think the answer should be? And what do you think the group thought? Price is right rules you, uh, without going over. Okay, so I would say four and a half is what I think and three may be the answer, but there's a really important element that I didn't hit on in why we want people back, at least in this hybrid work environment. It's also about culture. Like how do you train and nurture this, this next generation? Like I so benefited from the apprenticeship model right. throughout my career and I believe that continues. And so there's a knowledge element to it. There's a, a culture element to it. Maybe I would even call it a five, but in this hybrid, the okay. reason I said four and a half is I think it's hybrid, but okay. I, I'm interested. I'm in guessing, and I don't know, just to play the prices right rules, I'm gonna go 2.8 just to see. Let's show everybody the results. Can we do that? There it is, 3.36. So you win. Ruth Porat. Well, the point I would make is, does 3.36 mean that you only need to be in the office part of the time? Is it, is it, you had a question that was either a binary one, in or out, or maybe it implies you don't need to be there five days a week, but maybe three days a week. So not sure how to analyze that data, but I think that mixture Always is Always questioning the data. We will do this poll again based on the Ruth Porat formula uh, later in the day. Ruth, it's a pleasure to see you. Perfect. Thank you so much for doing Great this. Great to be with you again. Thank Appreciate you so it. much. And thank you all for uh, your questions and participating in the poll. We'll see you in just a little bit with Tim Sweeney of Epic, and I promise it will be epic.